¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Martín Reinado. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Martín Reinado. I'm prospective manager in Apresid. Today, August 24th, 5.30 p.m., we are in the second week of our Congress. I will moderate this presentation on nutrient management by uh, Corey Mulbauer. If you want to ask questions or if you want to listen to the presentation in English or in Spanish, you can uh, change the configuration, the setting. Also, at the side of the right side of your screen, you can start writing down your questions. And so then we are going to ask questions to him. Re remember that you have a section called participants. Please. Don't forget to go to Apresid uh, stand and uh, don't uh, forget to use the hashtag Congreso Apresid to participate. Coro, Cody is an agronomist for 20 years now. He worked in a consultant uh, agronomic company. He was agronomy manager. He was responsible to coordinate and implement um, field trials. He works in precision planting since 2009. He is responsible for R&D. And uh, he uh, was graduate with an agricultural science degree in the year 2000. My name is Corey Mulbauer. I'm the lead agronomist for our R&D department at Precision Planting. I work out of Tremont, Illinois, where our headquarters is. And I'm going to share some of the research and, and learning that I do um, in my career, in my job. Uh, most of my research is done in North America and it's involved with testing all things related to farming, basically. Um, planting, of course, planting equipment, performance in the field, and how to achieve maximum performance from all aspects of farming decisions. So this session is called Rethinking Nutrient Management. What I'm gonna to talk to you about is just setting some fundamental concepts around how I view managing fertilizer, as well as um, kind of the standard system in North America today, and through my research, ways that we could get better uh, with improving fertilizer efficiency. And, and fundamentally, I like to start out with, I think about there's three basic principles of achieving maximum yield in any crop in the world. And those are sunlight, water, and nutrients. Basically, all of our management decisions on a farm are involved with utilizing the resources of our sunlight, our water, and our nutrients to maximize the yield potential. It includes equipment, crop protection, chemicals, fertilizer, everything involved in the system um, impacts the sunlight, water, and nutrient utilization. So we're going to start out talking about nutrients specifically. Uh, and how they're involved. The typical system <clears throat> in North America is we broadcast a significant amount of our N, P, and K the fall before our crop is planted, roughly six months ahead of time. We monitor this by soil testing and we have a build maintain mentality where we apply more fertilizer until our soil test values are at an optimum range. From the universities, uh, the agronomy, agronomic universities, they publish some standards for guidelines on how to manage the system. So in this chart, you see percentage of yield potential and a green line. And obviously the economic optimum is when we achieve a level of maximum yield without over investing in fertilizer and across 
the bottom, you've got from very low to very high soil test nutrient values. Uh, this is chart is representing phosphorus fertilizer program. If we're broadcasting and, and applying all of our fertilizer to the soil itself as a broadcast, the university research has established a high level of soil nutrient values that we need to maintain in order to always have full yield potential when it comes to that particular nutrient. We don't want to slide over here to the left because yield limitations and loss of potential profit can exist. The way the system really works is 100% of the fertilizer nutrients are applied to the soil. The soil is considered a bank of those nutrients, a soil bank, uh, but it's not a very reliable soil bank. This soil bank is extremely dependent on weather patterns cold to warm shifts in the weather, wet to dry shifts in the weather, all impact how much actually get, becomes available to the crop. It's actually only about 10% or less of applied fertilizer is available to the crop that same growing season. The remainder is tied up to be utilized later on years down the road. <clears throat> What the soil bank actually is, is it's the cation exchange capacity of the soil. The clay lattices and the organic matter in the soil make up um, the total exchange capacity system. Exchange capacity consists of negative charges on the soil particles and in the organic matter, um, also holding organic forms of the nutrients that aren't yet crop available. And that total system makes up uh, the exchange capacity. There's a massive amount of nutrients in a healthy soil's exchange capacity, but only less than 1% of those nutrients is actually in solution where root, plant roots can uptake those nutrients at any given time. The way to keep that exchange capacity working at its best, the top level of productivity for exchanging nutrients into solution is to understand that microbes are a key driver for this system. In just one teaspoon of healthy soil, there's more microorganisms than there are people on the planet. To maintain a full healthy ecosystem of microorganisms, your pH of your soil is a key component. If you can maintain pH just slightly acid at about a 6.8 pH, you'll have the full population of microbes helping you convert tied up nutrients in your soil bank and make them more available to the crop. But given this is a microbial system, we're still talking about a very weather dependent system. Um, so it's still unpredictable on which day and which hour there's gonna be adequate nutrients given to the crops. The overall goal of fertilizing our crops is we wanna make sure that we can hit the maximum of yield, right? So here's another example of methodology around how we apply fertilizer and how much. So there's nutrient supply from left to right across the bottom, it's increasing. And then we've got the yield potential in corn on the left-hand axis over here. So this dotted line arch is yield potential. And so the soil uh, handbooks from our universities, uh, they recommend a high level of soil nutrients measured by soil tests so that we're in this luxury consumption zone and we don't have any limited yield based on soil supplying power of the field. What you don't want to end up in, but many farmers do, is this hidden hunger zone. You see, farmers fight this category between hidden hunger and luxury consumption because it costs money, it costs a lot of money to invest in fertilizer to maintain luxury consumption. And as we cut back on input expenses, it's very easy to fall into a hidden hunger zone where we don't have adequate nutrients, but yet it's not obvious by crop symptoms that we've lost some yield. Over in the deficient zone is when we have significantly low nutrient levels available to the crop. And it's very obvious because the crops will have significant symptoms showing that there's nutrient deficiencies. So the scary zone to be in is a hidden hunger zone where there's easy increase in profits from applying more fertilizer, but we don't know it because the symptoms aren't available uh, in the crop. So here's an example of that. When you scout a field as an agronomist, what you look for is the color of the crop, the uniformity and consistency of the crop. This is a picture from one of our research farms. And when I look at this picture, I would say this crop is doing very well. 
it has a very uniform color and very uniform plant size. And this corn, uh, which is right at about a V5, V6 growth stage, is just finishing the stage where it sets its maximum yield potential or ear size. So the question is, is this corn hungry? Is there hidden hunger in this field? Well, it's not until we do further research that we realize the same hybrid of corn planted on the same day, but with a different nutrient or fertilizer treatment can be significantly healthier and increase the yield potential at a significant level. As you look on the left, where we banded some nutrients with the planter and significantly increased the plant health and plant growth rate, as well as the darker color of the crop. So trials are needed and more effort is needed to make sure that any farmer is adequately feeding their crop and they are in a hidden hunger scenario, losing yield and profit. We do a lot of research looking at positioning nutrients with the planter. This is one of our research planters running. We apply different banded options with uh, the planter and we also have the ability to broadcast nutrients out the back of the planter so we can check how we're performing against traditional, more standard broadcasted applications. There's many options to band nutrients. In North America, we have a good supply of uh, fluid fertilizers. It's basically your daps, potashes, and all of the granulars that are common around the world solubilized and offered in a liquid form, um, which just helps with accuracy of placement and accuracy of control of how and when and how much we're applying those fertilizers. Basically, the opportunity with banding um, looks like this. This is my my vision or summary of, of how the relationship works. So the soil nutrient supply is across the bottom and it's we're increasing the soil test values you move from left to right the amount of fertilizer needed to reach optimum yield is increasing from bottom to top as represented by the left hand axis so if we have low soil test fertility levels then <clears throat> we're going to need more fertilizer and the opportunity for increased efficiency by banding in the green bar versus broadcast on the orange bar is about a 50% reduction in fertilizer cost to achieve the same optimum yield. In the middle, if you have uh, moderate soil test levels, there's probably a 30% increase in efficiency with fertilizer um, in a banded form versus a broadcast form. And then as you get to very high soil test levels, there's maybe a 10% opportunity in improved efficiency with banding. The reason for that is um, the soil supplying power of nutrients becomes very strong when the soil test levels are very high. So there's only certain times of the season where the band of nutrients is additional value over the broadcasted nutrients. So just to kind of give you another perspective on the opportunity of banding to increase efficiency of nutrients versus broadcasting. I wanna talk a little bit about feeding nutrients to livestock. My grandpa Louie, uh, when I was <clears throat> growing up back in Iowa, was a hog farmer, and he was a very progressive businessman, always looking for a way to increase profits and lower costs of his inputs. He was one of the first in his area to implement um, uh, trough hog feeding and confinement hog feeding where it was a much more controlled system um, by feeding the hogs in a trough and, and a lot less weight. We had an old neighbor, Hank Sino. Hank was very slow to adopt new concepts and ideas and just enjoyed the fun of farming uh, and still raised his pigs through all of his years out in the dirt lot and just poured the grain on the ground for the pigs to, to eat up. The difference in the two was my grandpa, as soon as he implemented the confined controlled feeding system, he was able to feed 30% less feed and got his pigs to market weight 30% faster. And you can see the difference in broadcasting the nutrients onto the soil where a significant portion of it is lost to the soil and unable to be utilized by the crop, which in this case is pigs, where if you have a more controlled band of nutrients, the efficiency goes up significantly. So the way you have to interpret a banded system with university nutrient management recommendations based on soil tests is 
having the efficiency of the band decouples your dependency on high soil test value nutrient levels. So you would shift your recommendation process for soil test values from the high range in a broadcast system over to a medium range of soil test values in a combination banding and broadcast system. So your new soil maintenance level is medium instead of high. Your economic yield is now shifted left with some banding in your fertilizer system. You can achieve full yield at a much lower soil test value and you can save a significant amount of money by not maintaining high soil test levels. It's good to understand um, key nutrients and how they're impacted certain times of the year in the limitations of crop availability. Phosphorus, for example, is a very important element in cell elongation and division in crops, and it's a very important element for the energy storage and energy release of the sugars and in the photosynthesis process and all of those things. Phosphorus is extremely immobile in soil. It's a positive charge element, so it's always tied up with um, I'm sorry, it's a negative charge element. It's always tied up with positive charge cations like potassium, calcium, and all of, all of those types of nutrients. Um, so it's very tough to have it mobile in the soil environment. <clears throat> the root mass of small crops are too small. They're not tapped into a large soil volume yet. So it's very common for them to struggle to get adequate nutrients because they have a limited amount of soil mass to uh, pull nutrients from. And the soil is very dependent on microbial activity to adequately feed nutrients stored in the CEC and in the organic matter. So the soil temperatures have to be above 65 degrees Fahrenheit before microbes become active enough to be providing nutrients to the plant. So early in the season when temperatures are cool and soil is damp, uh, we don't get a lot of nutrient availability when it comes to phosphorus. Spent a lot of time and years studying positioning phosphorus starter fertilizer relative to the plants to find what's the optimum position for a phosphorus starter fertilizer. This is an example of one of the many trials and here on the left we have zero uh, fertilizer applied. We have an all in furrow treatment. We have furrow jet which we'll discuss later which is a three position treatment represented by the blue dots. We have a huck step shoe, which is just a half inch from the plant. And then there's the two by two coulters, which are pretty common, two inches away from the plant and equal to seed depth is the most common. We found that in all the trials that when we had nutrients accessible by the very earliest seedling roots, we achieved the highest yield potential or the highest yield response to that same amount of fertilizer just positioned differently relative to the plant. We also looked at the optimum rates of phosphorus fertilizers applied with the planter and we went from zero to 15 gallons per acre of a liquid 723.5. Um, <clears throat> it's a polyphosphate product and we found that somewhere in the 10 gallon per acre range, depending on the trial, it, it was anywhere from eight to 12 gallons per acre, we averaged highest yield response with starter banded with the planter is at the 10 gallon range. So we have a little bit of an issue there. You can't put a salt-based polyphosphate in the seed furrow where the seedling roots can access it at a 10 gallon per acre rate. Um, so that's why we designed a product called FurrowJet, which can apply a triple band of a liquid product placing two thirds of the product in the soil beside the row where it's safe for the seed and just one third of the product in the furrow where the seedling roots can get access to it. This allows us to achieve the maximum response rate of 10 gallon per acre of 723.5, as well as the quick response of those seedling roots having access to the product. We've done multiple years of trials. I'm summarizing four years, 2015 through 2018. Visually, every time we band a phosphorus nutrient near the row, we always see bigger, better, healthier plants setting the yield potential higher for the rest of the season. As I summarize those four years of trials, first year was uh, 2015, we had very wet, cloudy, and cool planting conditions and early 
uh, third of the season. Got a 10 to 27 bushel per acre response with the starter fertilizers. 2016 was very um, optimum rain and optimum temperatures. Um, the soil supplying capability of nutrients must have been at a very high level, good mineralization. The banded nutrients was a zero to five bushel per acre response. In 2017, we had very mixed weather patterns um, throughout the regions where our trials were. And so we got anywhere from zero to 20 bushel per acre responses uh, with the band of starter nutrients. In 18, we had a very similar uh, situation, variable uh, weather, some areas droughty, some areas with more rain, and we had a uh, anywhere from three to 18 bushels per acre response with that eight to 10 gallon per acre of our liquid starter. So after four years, um, what, what we need to realize is that <clears throat> the banded nutrients is really weatherproofing um, the supply of nutrients to the crop. The CEC and the soil supply is very weather dependent and it fluctuates significantly by weather patterns. If we ban some nutrients, especially early in the season, we can achieve much more consistent um, crop growth and crop vigor. Our average over the four years with a widely variable weather pattern is 10 bushels per acre and that's a $30 an acre increase in profit um, using the same total volume fertilizer. Nitrogen is another animal. So we talked about phosphorus. Nitrogen is extremely volatile where phosphorus is very fixed and doesn't move. Nitrogen ultimately wants to be in the atmosphere. We create phosphorus or nitrogen fertilizer by pulling it out of atmosphere. We generate anhydrous ammonia and most of our nitrogen fertilizers come from that base source of anhydrous ammonia. So it's very common to see nitrogen deficiency issues in crops like this corn crop with the yellowing effects happening out here um, and it's not adequately fed. It's good to understand that nitrogen, similar to other nutrients, um, is very critical in the early part of the season uh, to get adequate amounts of plants because you have to have it applied within reach of that small plant's root system. So in this example, you see a timeline of corn development from planting the seed all the way through um, to tassel on the far right. And the amount of nitrogen needed on a daily basis is represented by the thickness of this line through the middle. Early in the season, we have cold, wet conditions and variable weather, and also microbes are just firing up. When microbes first fire up, uh, a period of immobilization happens where they're consuming available nitrates and competing for the available nitrates with the crop. So you have to have nitrogen and nitrates within reach of the crop system. And the best way to do that is by banding it near the row. Later in the year, the total volume of nitrogen just has to be there to feed the crop. There's mineralization happening, the soil is supplying it. So it is less critical other than applying during this time is better than applying early before the crop is there because loss is always a major risk. We've done a number of trials. We're looking at common applications of that spring early season nitrogen application in corn. The most common is broadcasting it with a sprayer as we put the herbicide on the field. Um, but the better method is banding near the row like you see in the picture here. And so we did a number of tests to figure out the opportunity there. One of the ways we tested this is we worked with the University of Illinois, Dr. Mulvaney and his grad student Kelsey helped us set up a, a way to trace the nitrates that were applied with the fertilizer all the way into the plant. And it's using a method called a stable isotope. A stable isotope is a manufactured nutrient that looks and feels and acts exactly like the original in environment, but because it's slightly different in molecular weight, here's the stable isotope N15, natural nitrogen is N14. So slightly heavier molecular weight makes it traceable uh, throughout the environment. We applied <clears throat> by hand, uh, broadcasted applications of the spring upfront nitrogen as well as then banded near the row with both single and dual applications. We hand harvested the corn plants and separated leaves, stalks, grain, um, and processed all of those in a lab where they have a mass spectrometer that's able to um, pick out or separate the 15N heavier nitrogen. And uh, the results that Dr. Mulvaney produced 
was that broadcasted nitrogen is about 27% efficient at getting into the plant. A single band with our conceal uh, product that knifes it next to the row moves you up to 43% efficient at getting the fertilizer into the plant. And then the dual band near the row with our conceal attachment moves it up to 51 and a half percent efficiency of utilizing that fertilizer in the plant itself. So we noticed that going from broadcasted nitrogen uh, at planting time to banding a dual band, one on each side of the row with the planter, doubles the uptake efficiency of that fertilizer. That means the dollars we spend on this nitrogen, we're getting twice as much of that dollar investment into the plant producing yield as opposed to broadcasting the nitrogen. That's a significant improvement. So we also have large agronomic trials where we're just measuring yield response by nitrogen placement. Very common uh, applications again are broadcasted nitrogen, banded near the row as an option, and then we band in the season to increase the efficiency as well. And so we did trials to look at all of this 225 pounds of, of nitrogen per acre applied just broadcast, just banded with a planter, just with the side dress bar, and then a combination of the three or just two of the three uh, to learn about single, dual, and triple applications. The results from uh, two years of that trial are that single nitrogen applications yield about 184 bushels and we're up to 212 bushels per acre by splitting the N into three separate applications. And these are all within season with the same amount of product. So the same fertilizer investment of nitrogen applied different, in different ways at different times increases the profit from that fertilizer by $96 an acre, almost $100 an acre increase in profit by moving from a single nitrogen application to a triple nitrogen application, three separate passes. And this would include a small amount broadcast, some applied banding with the planter and the rest side dress with a coulter after the crop is growing. The 2019 trial of the same thing as we broadcasted plus side dress later with the, with the planter, 214 bushels. When we take half of that broadcast application and apply it in a dual band with the planter using conceal, we increased our profit of that nitrogen by $40 an acre without buying any additional fertilizer. Again, that's using this conceal knife product that precision planning has developed. So overall, our multi-year studies have showed us that banding phosphorus with our furrow jet, the triple band placement, is giving us about a $30 an acre increase in our fertilizer investment, and banding nitrogen with the dual application of conceal on each side of the row, roughly three inches away, one inch below the surface, we're getting about a $40 an acre increase in profits. So I wanted to take nutrient research a step further. <clears throat> For three years, I've been doing work to see if we fully implement banded nutrients on the planter, both phosphorus, nitrogen, and a little bit of potassium, and we shift the soil test recommendations from the optimum high level that the universities recommend in an all broadcast system to the moderate level of soil test values, saving money on the soil maintenance broadcast of fertilizer, what are the economics and yield potential um, that we could experience? So one of our fertility trials um, is by Morton, Illinois. We have, it's a fairly low fertility soil test field. Um, there had been no fertilizer applied there for 25 years. The owner of this field um, was holding back on fertilizer investment because of the assumption of it someday being sold for housing development. Uh, houses have not yet been developed there and it's 25 years later with no fertilizer except for nitrogen on the corn and wheat crops that he grew. So it gave us a wonderful opportunity to learn about what's the best ROI on managing fertilizer when soil test values are low. Uh, and then we have two other farms where we have normal to high soil test values that we're doing very similar programs. Um, this field is high productive soils at a three to 4% organic matter level. Here are the fertilizer programs that we're evaluating. All programs are getting the same amount of nitrogen in total pounds. So we're not studying nitrogen um, and, and its rates. We're mostly looking at changing how we manage the soil test build process. 
in the nitrogen rates, um, we are applying differently as opposed to the amount of broadcast versus banding. Uh, so only the banding treatment in the middle is getting uh, banded nitrogen with the planter. The other treatments, nitrogen only and broadcast high soil test build is getting uh, spring broadcasted in. All three get the same amount of side dressed liquid nitrogen with a coulter. Um, so they all do get uh, a portion of their program banded uh, during the season. The total amount of phosphorus being applied is 115 pounds per acre in our moderate soil build and 60 pounds of potassium. That's just slightly over removal rate um, for a 220 bushel yield gold corn crop. In the broadcast high soil build program, the university's agronomy recommendation is that we need 200 pounds of P205 and 240 pounds of potassium per acre to get the soil test levels built up much higher to their high optimum range. This is 400 pounds of DAP and 400 pounds of potash being applied every year for four years to get those soil test levels where they need to be. What we're investing in these fertilizer programs, the nitrogen only program, just $98 an acre for that 240 pounds of N. In the banding plus moderate soil build, we're spending $186 an acre on that N, P, and K. And to build the soil test levels very high where the university recommendation is, we're over $240 an acre. So the question we have is, can we achieve enough yield to make up the difference of $151 an acre in cost of fertilizer from the cheapest to the most expensive program. Our soil test levels when we started this field were a six part per million Bray P1 value, a 130 part per million potassium value, and a pH of 5.5. So obviously it was not very well maintained by the farmer that owns the field. In 2019, three years later, our <clears throat> soil test values um, have not changed other than we did start liming the field. Um, we don't want this to be a pH study. So we brought all, or all blocks are getting lime to correct the pH. The banded low soil build, we're achieving our target of a lower number of 20 part per million on the P1, 170 on the K, and 6.2 pH, you can see, is, is improved. So that's about where we want to maintain at a moderate soil test level. The broadcast high build program, you can see we've moved the needle a little higher. The P1 value is 24 part per million and 225 part per million on the K, 6.1 pH. So we're still trying to move this phosphorus value a little higher. We got another year of 400 pounds DAP um, and the potassium is starting to settle in there one more year of 400 pounds of potash and we will probably be there. All throughout the season, you can visibly see a significant difference. The broadcasted NP and K blocks are across the center. You can see they're delayed in growth and health. Um, everywhere that we banded NP and K with the planter, significantly bigger. And this picture was taken in June. Our planting date is typically in May, so a month after planting. <clears throat> this is July. Um, just before tasseling on the more advanced corn, you can see significant differences between the banded treatment and the all broadcast treatment. And keep in mind, the all broadcast treatment has significantly more fertilizer. One good time of the year to evaluate how good a job you're doing in your fields is you look at the uniformity of maturity right at tassel time. Tassel time is a phenomenal time to do this evaluation because it is a very <clears throat> clear picture of how uniform the nutrients and the growth rate has been for the crop. Notice the in-season banded program over here, very uniform and more advanced in maturity. All tassels are out and very uniform. The nitrogen only block that lacks P and K is behind in maturity, hasn't started tasseling yet. And the fall broadcast of very high levels of DAP and potash, you see very inconsistent tasseling. The reason for that is the CEC, the soil bank release of those high amounts of broadcast fertilizer is inconsistent throughout this block um, because of the weather patterns not always supplying the soil applied fertilizer when it's needed to the plants. The yield average over three years, we're getting 172 bushels per acre in the nitrogen only block, 238 bushels per acre 
in the banded blocks with less a lower soil build target and 235 bushels per acre in the very high fertilizer target to build the soil test levels up. One thing that we noted is just the value of P and K in a program. If you're trying to cut back on costs and you cut out your DAP and your potash applications and only apply nitrogen in a crop like corn, there's a 60 bushel per acre difference in yield when you have lower soil test values. So there's a huge profit opportunity in managing phosphorus and potassium in a corn crop. The ROI or profit from these programs, the three year average is um, the banded block winning at $647 an acre. It's $150 an acre uh, better than the nitrogen only. And the higher soil test uh, build target from the university recommendations, we're beating that program by $73 an acre. Just showing how powerful having banded nutrients in a program is for achieving maximum yield. So we have these types of studies going on in three different fields. We've been doing this for three years. The combined data is 900 acres of, of total data that we've been looking at um, in this program. The biggest difference between the standard inefficient program is that it's only focused on feeding the soil the nutrients and the soil giving it to the crop. That's very inefficient and unreliable. An optimized system is a combination of banding and decoupling from a high soil test build target to save some dollars on fertilizer. The only difference equipment wise that we changed for, our, for a fertilizer application is we now are applying fertilizer with the planter, where in the standard program in North America, it's just sprayer, side dress, and fall broadcast. So this optimized system where we're banding nutrients in season and we're adjusting our soil test build targets, all three farms over three years are averaging a $61 an acre increase in profit um, due to the combination of increased yield and Incre and savings on fertilizer. How to achieve this system? You want to improve soil sampling accuracy. To run leaner and tighter on your soil test values, um, you want to be representing the field as best possible. Smart zones that are sample locations with composite samples, blended samples throughout that location that are guided by soil types organic matter content and elevation and yield maps within fields are gonna give you a lot more accurate representation of a field than just uh, random grid point and interpolated data. Increased sampling frequency to one or two years. There's a growing trend in the United States that we are moving to more of a two year sampling interval. I think in the future we can easily justify the low cost of soil sampling every season and only applying nutrients based on brand new uh, soil test data every single year. Lower soil build targets when putting on some NP and K in a band. You don't need high soil test build levels like most university recommendations have in their handbooks. Reallocate broadcast fertilizer to in-season banding. It seems to be a really good uh, ratio to have at least a quarter of your nitrogen program put on with the planter and a corn crop and band at least a third of the phosphorus program on the planter near the row as well. Maximize in-season banding. Um, the bulk of your nitrogen program, if not 100% of the nitrogen program should be applied during the crop growing season, not before. Nitrogen is volatile and easy to lose, so it's not worth the risk. Great place for some P and K in season as well um, to have the efficiency of the band. So if you apply it with a side dress applicator or drop tubes on a high clearance sprayer, whatever that might be, um, that's a high efficiency way to put it on. So again, remember yield equals sunlight, water, and nutrients. I wanna to touch a little bit on how do we manage sunlight and water in a system? If we assume that sunlight and water are a fixed input and we can't control it, um, what does that mean with how we manage it? Well, it has to do with the way we establish each individual plant within our field. It comes from population, spacing of plants, and uniform emergence of plants. Ultimately, we wanna capture 100% of the sunlight that's available, and we don't want to lose any water from the soil uh, through evaporation. So if 100% of the sunlight is captured, then all of the water will leave the field through transpiration through the plant, which drives yield as opposed to evaporation, which is loss of water. So an optimized crop looks like this. 
perfectly spaced plants, perfectly uniform in size. That's how you optimize sunlight, water, and nutrients. Wasted sunlight, water, nutrients comes with lady merge plants, plants that are small in size that are not likely to produce any yield. They will still use the resources in the field, but they don't provide any yield to give you a profit at the end of the year. The average farmer has three to five lady merge or non-productive plants in one one thousandth of an acre in the United States. That's about an 85% effective stand when it comes to generating yield that will provide profit to you at the end of the year. The causes of this are a number of things. Residue management, seed depth, seed to soil contact, furrow closing, seed spacing, managing soil moisture and proper depth. All of those things are critical. And it seems like all crops have the exact same uh, negative impact of lady merge plants not producing yield. We've looked at uh, sunflowers, small grains, soybeans, of course. Here's an example of a soybean plot where we evaluated the cost of lady merge plants. So we have severely late, moderately late, and on time emerged soybean plants. The moderately late plants are producing over two years uh, average on this research, 30% fewer bean pods than the on-time plants and the severely late plants are producing 68 almost 70 percent fewer pods than the plants that emerge on time. Sugar beets is another crop that has a significant impact on this like all crops. Here's an evaluation of sugar beets emerged on time and as you move up the picture um, severely late sugar beet plants. This data shows the size of the beets and the diameter of the beets, the dark green showing the average weight of the beets, the on-time plants up here and a significant loss all the way over to the late emerge group three, roughly 40% of the weight of the on-time plants. The diameter of the beets is directly affected as well. The diameter of the late emerge beets are roughly 60% the diameter of the on-time plants. So a call to action that I have for you is to achieve 99% uniform plants. This is the only way that you can fully optimize all of the cropping resources you've put into the crop. All the money that you've invested in the crop um, is, is going to depend on this uniformity of plants. We've put together um, some yield pyramid. It's a, it's a yield pyramid based on factors that influence that uniformity when it comes to an equipment management uh, standpoint. So what can you do to your planter or your planter pass to increase this uniformity? The primary uh, way that you significantly improve your uniformity of emerged plants is by managing residue with a row cleaner and seed firming as well as downforce to control to achieve accurate depth and accurate soil placement um, when it comes to a seed by seed basis. So emergence is the primary factor of maximizing and optimizing yield. Second to that is the singulation accuracy of the seeds themselves. So are we dropping one seed at a time? Are we skipped, are there skips and missing plants? Are we dropping doubles, which don't do as well as single plants? So singulation is very important and the meter accuracy on your planter is gonna be the thing that you go to there. Make sure it's running at a top level. Spacing is very important. How the seed is delivered to the ground. We need to maintain equal plant spacing to get the optimum yield potential between plants. And then population control is very important. And this you want to be accurate, have an accurate drive system. We've moved to electric drive uh, on, drives on all of our meters because we get a lot better population accuracy and we can compensate when you're turning uh, uh, the planter and you need different RPM per row on a planter in curve situations. So thank you for your time. I uh, enjoyed presenting at this conference. If you have any questions or any follow-up information on more research and more studies that, that we do here at Precision Planning, feel free to go to our website, precisionplanning.com or any one of our social media sites. You can also find more information on our equipment or locate a Precision Planning service center or, or dealer uh, that can help you get set up with improvements to your planter system to maximize and optimize your, your yield. Hello, my name is Corey Mulbauer. Mulbauer, 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 Mulbauer,
Paz. Bueno, estamos acá de vuelta. Eh, well, we are back. First, thanks, Cory, for your presentation. And now we will have some 10, 15 minutes for questions and answers with Cory. I'm going to ask you, Cory, please, to open your mic for the Q&A. And please speak slowly to uh, facilitate the job of the interpreters. The first question I have for you, Corey, relates to the name of your presentation. That is Rethinking Nutrient Management. Could you briefly summarize? I mean, you did so throughout the presentation, but could you summarize the main causes or reasons why we need to rethink nutrient management today? In the United States, all of the university guidelines and recommendations for managing fertilizer are based on high rates of broadcast fertilizer to build soil test nutrient levels up high enough to the point at which the crop stops responding to additional fertilizer um, to increase yield. And it's a very efficient way to apply fertilizer and have it utilized in a single cropping season. So my research is looking at uh, evaluating the opportunities with banded fertilizers throughout uh, the season, starting with early in the season uh, when the planter plants the seed and, and banding nutrients uh, alongside the row and measuring how we can have lower dependency on high soil test maintained values through high rates of broadcasted fertilizers. Um, and so the research shows that we don't, we shouldn't follow university guidelines for very high soil test levels. When we're banding nutrients in our fertilizer system, we can save a significant amount of fertilizer by maintaining lower soil test levels because we have the efficiency and dependability of the banded nutrients near the row. Thank you, Corey. The next question I have for you has to do with Morton S19 tests that you showed. I will have two questions for you in this regard. The first one is, what was the crop rotation implemented uh, as part of these tests? And secondly, uh, how or to what you can attribute the pH increase from 5.5 to 6.2 in two years? Yes, and that trial uh, that I used as the primary example in the presentation, um, the crop rotation there is corn following corn. So we've had continuous corn and deep tillage in the fall to cycle the prior year's uh, crop residue into the soil to break it down and to have a cleaner environment for the new crop. So it's a uh, heavy tillage environment and it's been continuous corn. The reason for the continuous corn is I wanted to get research response data uh, specifically for corn yields and corn economics. Um, so I chose to do corn after corn uh, in that trial for the first four years. So we're currently in our fourth year. Um, the data I showed was our first three year summary of the trial. And after we get four years, I plan to shift it to a corn soybean rotation and continue collecting data. The uh, improvement in the pH of the soil, our target pH is a 6.5. And we, that when we started that field, the pH was a 5.5. Uh, so we've been liming 
um, with ag lime or limestone uh, available here in the United States from uh, lime quarries. And uh, we, so we broadcast what we call ag lime and uh, we've put on about two tons a year, two tons per acre um, each year for the first three years to move that pH from a 5.5 to a 6.2. Thank you. The next question I have for you is the following. How could you apply these concepts to uh, no-till systems? I mean, the question is whether these same ideas or these same uh, thoughts that you witnessed in uh, broadcast fertilization or banded fertilization trials might be applied to no tillage systems. So some of my research fields are no-till corn into uh, prior year soybean crops. So we very common have a corn and soybean rotation in the Midwestern United States. So one of the three primary uh, fertilizer research fields is a corn soybean rotation. When we plant the corn, it's a no-till into the soybean stubble. Um, and I've done a number of other uh, more specific research trials in, in starter fertilizer, phosphorus, and or nitrogen placement in a variety of crop rotations, uh, both no-till, tilled and minimum till, as well as strip till. Um, all crop, all tillage rotations seem to have the same nutrient response uh, relationship at a high level, uh, the way that I presented it in this, in this presentation. And that is a large increase in efficiency and uh, yield or bushel response um, to having some nutrients banded near the row, primarily phosphorus and, and nitrogen. Um, and when I summarize at the end, the numbers I used was uh, a quarter to a third of your phosphorus or nitrogen program banded very near the row so that the small plants can get access to that. Seems to be a really good uh, ratio to have in your program and the remainder um, would be applied then later in the season uh, or in a deeper band, maybe with a strip till system or a, um, uh, a granular fertilizer Coulter farther off to the side uh, from the row unit, something like that. But the relationship of, of the banded nutrient efficiencies um, having a significant value over primarily broadcast fertilizer systems with a focus on high soil test values um, is the same regardless of tillage situation. Thank you. And this leads me to the next question, which is whether the nutrient replenishment that you have analyzed was the, za the same when you applied fertilizer, in the case phosphorate uh, nutrient uh, uh, and, I mean, application um, broadcast versus banded. Okay, I'll ask him to repeat. Which were the replenishment values of nutrients obtained when you changed the form of application, uh, whether they were similar or different, depending on whether you applied uh, on a banded uh, fashion or uh, broadcast? Could you hear the question now? So nutrient replenishment um, after a banded application of nutrients versus a broadcast application of nutrients, I think is what the question is asking. Um, so nutrient replenishment is primarily uh, the nutrients removed that's in the grain that we harvest from a field. Um, and the replenishment would be equal um, to, uh, to balance the crop. We call it the crop removal nutrients. Um, and that's a measured value 
that can come from a grain sample to tell you um, how much phosphate, how much potassium, how much nitrogen, uh, primarily phosphates and potassium were removed when we harvested the grain. So that's the same in either system of banding or broadcast. Um, the other portion of nutrient management is, is um, maintaining a, a soil level of nutrients, which comes from soil testing, soil sampling. Um, and that seems to be consistent as well. A, a pound of nutrients applied seems to do a, a good job of maintaining uh, the field, whether it's uh, broadcasted or, or banded. What changes the most is the efficiency uh, that the crop has, the growing crop in that season that it has at, at getting access to those nutrients. Thank you very much. Lastly, I, we have another question, which is which has two parts to it. The first one is or relates to a way of thinking, a concept which consists in fertilizing a rotation rather than the crop itself. The question is whether you can reflect upon that. And the second part of the question has to do with whether you have any trials in place or whether you have considered the incorporation of cover crops such as veg before corn in order to contribute uh, part of the nitrogen from a biological source. Yes, I understand. So uh, my experience in, in crop rotations with a, a cover crop, a beneficial green crop in between cropping seasons. Um, it is a struggle in the region that I do research. Uh, we're far enough north in the United States that our growing season is very short. Um, we only have about nine months of conditions that are warm enough to grow a, a crop. So most of that nine months is consumed by the primary crop itself, and there's very little time to grow a cover crop in between. There are a number of researchers, uh, you know, attempting intercropping, you know, trying to seed the cover crops uh, before harvest and get some growth established um, to try to get enough growth in the cover crop to provide some of those values. But it's, um, it's not a a common practice here because we're too far north and we don't have enough heat units um, to get those crops established. One, one thing I would make note of, um, because it is, it is common following a wheat crop here where we harvest wheat uh, in July and there's still three to four months of warm weather remaining in the season. So it's a good crop to grow a cover crop afterwards. Um, but when, when we grow a cover crop, we're introducing uh, more carbon and more biomass to a field. And the benefit in nutrients that we get from that comes from the decom decomposing of that carbon material, which is reliant on microbial activity in the soil. And that is also a nutrient consumption process. So that process consumes phosphates, consumes nitrates, which will cause competition for your cash crop um, to get access to those nutrients. So when cover crops are in the rotation, it is beneficial uh, long term. Um, but I just want to point out research locally here has found that it becomes very challenging to predict when your, your, your cash crop is, is going to have adequate access to the phosphorus and nitrogen key nutrients that it needs. Um, as that cover crop is is decomposing and breaking down, um, you know, during the season. Well, thank you very much, Corey. Lastly, and in closing, we have a question that relates precisely to the prospective management of nutrients. 
We would like to know what new technologies are there, whether it's sensors or uh, satellite imaging technologies that you think may be relevant in coming years. Yes, great question. Um, <clears throat> I think fertilizer management is the biggest opportunity in increasing the profits for farmers uh, in the world. Um, it's, it's been 50 years since soil sampling and nutrient recommendations was established and some of those correlations were built. Um, so new technology, I believe, is going to make a big shift in how we manage fertilizer. And I think it's going to come from a significant improvement in measurements of what the crop needs and better resolution in the fields as far as pointing out which zones of fields are in need of very particular nutrients um, to allow us to tighten up our uh, spend on nutrients and um, apply exactly what's needed and where it's needed. So some things that we're seeing here in the United States is robotic soil sampling with onboard sensors. Um, we're also uh, seeing you know, an increased use of, of drone and aerial imagery. Um, that's good for, for building the zones and, and finding out which areas of fields are struggling as far as crop health, but uh, they're not a direct link to what to apply or how to manage it. It just shows us where to go look. Um, so I, I think improvements in sensors, better technology to map out fields is, is a big part of that. Uh, we launched a new sensor three or four years ago called Smart Firmer. Um, so the seed firmer that um, firm seed into the bottom of the seed furrow has, um, has uh, an optical sensor on it that measures soil organic matter, soil moisture, soil temperature, a number of things. The soil organic matter map as the planter is planting seeds is mapping row by row high resolution soil zones in a field, which makes a highly accurate soil zone map that would be a good base layer to start managing a field at a, at a much more uh, higher resolution level when it comes to soil sampling, nutrient management, um, and uh, seeding rates and all of those things. Well, thank you very much, Corey, for your time. With this, we uh, conclude the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your time, for your presentation, and for the opportunity you have given us to have this exchange live. With this, we come to an end of today's session. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you and to all the people who uh, listened to your presentation and who sent in the questions. Let me remind you that throughout the week, uh, tomorrow we will be resuming uh, our activities, our agenda. Uh, at 8 a.m. Buenos Aires time. So we have four days lying ahead. Don't uh, miss them. Enjoy the most. Uh, greetings to you all, and uh, thank you very much again.